Hello and welcome to episode six in the New Normal webinar series. My name is Katie Meehan and on behalf of the Pearson Middle East Hub, we're really pleased that you've been able to join us today. I just wanted to run through the webinar format with you now. So the webinar will last for 40 minutes and it is a panel discussion. So if you have any questions for the panel, please type them into the Q&A chat box and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the session. We also recommend watching the webinar in gallery view so that you can clearly see all of the speakers on your screen. After the webinar, the Pearson Middle East team will send you a certificate of attendance by email. I'd now like to introduce our webinar panel chair, Professor Dr. Ger Graus OBE, who is the Global Director of Education at Kidsania. So I'll hand over to Ger now. Thank you again, Katie. Thank you again for making all this happen uh, and welcome. Online, offline, who is the teacher? In the last episode of this series, we asked what the new balance is like between online and, on and offline schooling and what implications this has for the teaching professions. Indeed, the essence of the matter may well be to ask ourselves who our new teachers are and what teachers will be doing and doing differently. So welcome to the sixth and final episode of this, the first series of webinars entitled It Is What It Is and We Are Where We Are, or to use the official title, The New Normal. The concept you know by now, it's a friendly, cozy, informative chat with a few smiles and lots of friends. And today I can truly say that all my guests are good friends. So, so I feel very much at home. Of course, the topic of debate is likely to be challenging at times, but I think between us we'll come up with some helpful ideas and some solutions too and hopefully we'll make the audience think. We'll try and take some of your questions as they arrive as well. My name is Gary Graus and I've been asked by Pearsons to host this series of webinars in my day job. I'm the Global Director of Education for Kidzania and for those of you who don't know, Kidzanias are two third size cities for four to 14 year olds where they can experience the world of work including numerous job choices and financial awareness and our aim is to take children from inspiration to aspiration and to get them to write their own narrative of the possible. As part of this I conduct research globally with the Universities of Oxford, Cambridge, the Government Equalities Office, Technological de Monterey in Mexico, National Research University in Moscow and so on and we pass that information to educators so that that will become of practical use and benefit to the children. Uh, there are a total of 30 containers globally. At the moment, there are 25 closed. Jeddah opened, reopened fairly recently, so we'll be back sooner than later. We'll be back better uh, too. Now to my guests, enough of me. Faisal Al-Balushi, Ali Balushi is the chairman of the Omani Society for Educational Technology and a good friend with whom I've met as often as possible, mostly in the Emirates Towers in Dubai. Our joint plans for a big education conference in Oman have been shelved until 2021. Watch this space though. Janneke Arnes is a highly respected Norwegian educationalist, educationalist and the founding head of school at the Dwight School in Dubai and a fellow member of the Dubai Future Council for Education and a trusted friend. Professor Colin Beard is an author, thinker, practitioner, and experiential learner, learning expert. He's also a fellow DIDA, a nickname for the citizens of Sheffield, which is in the north of England. Colin is also a very good friend. In fact, when I enter his name into my diary, he comes up as Professor Colin Urban Delhi 10. Urban Delhi being the place where we have shared many a breakfast and 10 o'clock, the time that mostly happens. So Colin, if I, my friend, may start with you. What was life like for you in early January 2020? And, and more importantly, perhaps, what were your plans for the rest of this year? Yes, that's interesting. In um, nearly every January, I go to Hong Kong, where I work with um, some fabulous organizations. But uh, one in particular is um, Kadori Farm and Botanic Gardens. Um, where David Attenborough has just narrated seven films. It's a wonderful place to work. Um, but I had other things to do, including working with Outward Bound Hong Kong. And uh, I had a, 
a message saying that uh, there was a, a virus floating around and I didn't really take much notice of it. In fact, it was some friends flying in from Canada. And um, I actually uh, left Hong Kong on the 13th of January. So I then came home to find out um, the, the seriousness of the situation. So I think I was quite lucky. And I think the other thing that's interesting is um, I do feel kind of lucky in a way because the lockdown as we call it but in Singapore they call it a circuit breaker I think that's quite interesting the language the different languages you know the, the feeling like you've been locked up is is uh, is an interesting one um, and because I have to write a new book and I feel this pressure I've signed a contract with uh, Routledge in New York that uh, by June 2021 20, uh, I will go and deliver my script uh, of a hundred thousand words, so the the lockdown for me has been a marvelous opportunity to uh, to read, to think in between doing all of my other uh, jobs, and um, I've actually quite enjoyed that side of it, and it's kept me sane. I have read so many books. I've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, learning and the way humans learn, um, and I perhaps shouldn't say this, but I've really enjoyed it. Oh, brilliant. Good for you, Colin. That's what I would say, my friend. Faisal, I, I know some of your plans. I'm kind of familiar with them. Uh, and you were working on some really big things and you were thinking about some really big things and events. Tell me what your plans were for this year and what's happened to them. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, 2020 was a very special year uh, for us in Oman. So um, we were planning to celebrate um, the the accomplishment of uh, our country's uh, strategic vision 2020, which started back in 1970. And, uh, and also the launch of uh, 2040 vision of the country. So we are basically, basically we're, we're trying to celebrate 50 year of education development or modern education development in Oman. And, and, uh, and we were focusing on digital transformation in education. In education. Uh, for that, we, we, were launch, we were trying to launch uh, national-wide projects. And to do that, we were you know, organizing, we were planning to organize a really big um, you know, uh, EdTech conference where we invited big players in EdTech market from all around the globe to join us and, and together write with us uh, our EdTech strategy for the country. And, and then suddenly this happens uh, and, and uh, and, and in, in a way, uh, I mean, as a society, uh, we were affected uh, uh, by trying to readjust, uh, you know, different things in society. But what actually happened is that we realize now that uh, it was a very early celebration. Um, in a, to, to say that we are celebrating, you know, and looking into digital transformation, what we discovered uh, Oman, like many countries in the region, they actually did not invest very well in digital transformation, and and mm. and uh, and all the you know investments, these millions of dollars, was just waste of time. So uh, you know, so so I mean, uh, this is what happened, uh, you know, from our point of view, uh, and I think because Victor Gore is is great part of this uh, plan actually, uh, and we were planning since last year, and we were. <laughs> back and forth meeting uh, you know and and as we discuss we grow bigger and bigger we had a really big dreams and uh, and unfortunately this is what happened and 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 we have to live with it like anybody else and like everybody else in the world i'm, I'm assuming faisal that your digital transformation plans will as a consequence of, of, of this crisis will look will end up looking very different to yes. what what they would have looked like had none of this happened, right? Yes, yes. Um, what happened is actually, uh, because we discovered that, I mean, as I said, that uh, there was no proper investment in ed tech market. There was no proper digital transformation, uh, you know, happening actually in the education sector. And, and when the uh, crisis happened, we also got no leadership, uh, like in the education sector that, you know, trying to take everybody into the right direction. So we had to step in uh, as a society and take that, not take, we claimed that leadership role. We start working and, and we started actually from now, uh, if we talk about digital transformation in the country, we are actually starting, we started like from the beginning. It's a, like, so we are 
you know, we've been involved with almost all organization here in Oman uh, in terms of uh, providing them, you know, edtech services, consultancy education services to make sure that, um, you know, the education maintained. Uh, at least, if not 100%, at least, you know, it should not be, uh, it should, in a way affect students learning. So yes, our digital transformation uh, plan now is a bit different because the project that we were planning to do, we had to do them now urgently. So we accelerated all our projects um, that we are planning to do next year. We actually, you know, did most of them. Uh, and now uh, even our plans for digital transformation is, is different. It's not necessary that it's more ambitious. Uh, actually, we also went back to, to, you know, to target the very basics that, um, you know, we never thought that that, that that's, that's an issue, that's a real issue. But when the crisis happened, we discovered there's some serious issues, uh, like basic things, like, you know, like uh, technology access, like inequality in, 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 in ed tech and in technology, uh, you know, either access or, or hardware or even skills. So we need to go back, uh, you know, to this before we move forward. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, quite a few of the observations that I'm getting through these webinars, but also through other events is that uh, the first one is we are not as good as we thought we, we were. And the second one is actually we have no new priorities. We just put the priorities in a different order and they have to happen faster. And I think that's, that's, that's been an interesting set of dynamics and how that's worked. Janneke, your immediate thoughts when this happened, your school is, is as good as brand new. It's got a reputation for being completely brilliant. What were your thoughts when, when that reality hit you and your school? I think one thing that was really beneficial for us, Sager, is the fact that we are, as a school, located in uh, the UAE. And uh, I say that based on uh, hearing the experience of colleagues around the world who's, who are also educational leaders and who were given the information in a very different manner where you had the prospect of maybe a one week, two week, three week uh, timeline in the beginning without really knowing what is going to happen after the week, after the second week, after the third week. So very fortunately for us, I think, uh, in, in the midst of everything was actually that the, uh, the education authorities in the UAE decided quite quickly that they would close down the schools all over the country until the end of the academic year. That allowed us to think differently about our delivery from day one so that we could avoid some of these uh, scenarios where education was put on hold. We had no time to put anything on hold. We had time only to shift our mindset and become digital in our delivery overnight. Now, another advantage also, and I recognize that compared to other colleagues worldwide, was that uh, the UAE was also, in a way, clever enough to, to bump up the holiday. So uh, instead of having a midterm break that would have come three weeks into the distance learning, they actually moved it forward. It gave all the schools two weeks of, uh, of break uh, to, to get used to the new norm. So, uh, so we went on a surprise holiday on March 8th, and we opened our distance learning on March 22nd. Uh, with the understanding that this was going to be our new normal until the end of the academic year. And that definitely from an, uh, from an educational perspective, uh, very challenging, but also giving us the advantage of being able to, to think differently from day one. Uh, it does not mean that we were perfectly set and that we have not made any changes along the way. Naturally, this was also new to us. We are fortunate at the Dwight School to have a, a solid IT, uh, digital infrastructure. So as an individual school, if I speak from a very selfish perspective as the leader of the Dwight School, we, we could transition relatively well. All our students had an individual device that we provide. So we had a lot of, a lot of uh, logistical issues that were not necessarily affecting our planning. But, uh, but we're used to being together. Education or education for in the K-12 sec sector that I work in is very much a social interaction. So moving that, that 
a collaborative environment where we are nurtured by our interactions with each other over into a digital uh, digital medium was of course very challenging for the students for the teachers and for the parents so even if there were benefits to the way that the planning had to happen in the uae we we have definitely faced many of the similar the same challenges as many schools globally will will talk about uh, in retrospect when we look back at these months of, uh, of distance learning i think i think the history will be interesting won't it? and I, I kind of i struggle sometimes a little bit certainly something we get in the uk where you get all the children are falling behind they're only falling behind what the government's dictated and 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 one has to think about how important that is really because you know i i, I watch my 14 year old and she She's been amazing in being incredibly well organised herself. She's cut my hair as well. So, so all all those things have just been have just been brilliant. And yesterday, I had the great fortune to um, I took I was part of as a, as a as a guest. I was part of the Leavers Assembly of the Pearl Academy, the Year Sixes at the Pearl Academy in in Abu Dhabi. And it was amazing. And this wasn't about maths and this wasn't about levels and this wasn't about exams. But you know what? Whole families were there. Everybody dressed up. There was a real sense of occasion. Um, so so I, was, I was kind of seriously impressed at that end, of course, right? Because at the same time, I think as you allude, we must always remember that this is not like that for all children. In fact, for the vast majority of children, it probably isn't. Can I ask how how are the schools in general and families in Dubai coping? How are the parents coping for that matter too? I, do, I, I think you're absolutely right that we have to remember that it is not it is not similar for all learners and it's certainly not similar for all schools nor for all parents and all teachers. Lots of schools have very different resources and uh, the, Dubai is no different in that regard. There are schools uh, on all kind of on, on the whole spectrum uh, in terms of in terms of resources and particularly maybe infrastructure resources to make a transition from a brick and mortar to a virtual education uh, solution. And uh, when you work in a private uh, in a private industry, it very much is down to the individual school also to make the adaptations. Whereas if you compare it to a country where predominantly education is governed by the authorities, the authorities will have a greater opportunity to make sure that there is a more equal spread of resources. So I recognize that in the UAE, we, we will definitely be in a landscape where there is a lot of a lot of differences. But there is also a relatively good support structure in place from the authorities to support schools that are struggling more than others. So I, I know uh, I know from from that angle that that schools have not necessarily been left alone to uh, to grapple with with the challenges, and schools in in more need for support have also received a different kind of support. Um, overall, I think I recognize parent voice as being uh, in a way uh, all over the scale. And I think it also, we have to remember that it's very different to be a parent of a five-year-old or a parent of a 15-year-old, for example. Personally, I have a grade 11 student and uh, he's, he's very self-managed. He has thankfully learned that through his education. So he's responsible for his own learning and he's doing very well with this. He doesn't need my parental support. And uh, then I know as an educational leader, we speak with our parents who have, who are working parents who have children uh, that are young, who cannot man manage on their own. And they feel the stress at a very, very different level than what I do in my role as a parent. So I think uh, to, uh, to Colin's uh, comment about having enjoyed the time and finding time to do something different, Overall, in the teaching industry, I think that the majority of teachers, and those would be my colleagues as well as teachers anywhere, will probably not be able to say that with the same kind of confidence. I think what I see is that teachers work even harder, their, their hours are much longer, uh, and there is very little time to find balance in their own life. So well-being is a big concern, um, something that we're very focused on. And it's something I think is one of the things that come out of, uh, of uh, the studies 
when we look back and back at this period is also to measure how successful this period has been in terms of taking care of people's well-being and uh, i think for both for students and teachers and, and parents for that matter i think that's very true i, I sometimes wonder Janneke, uh, that whether i should not be more concerned about the well-being of the teachers than that of the children uh, and i know there's a lot you know lots of big words are throwing around people are being traumatized and mental well-being and those big concepts i, I see amongst my my daughter and many of her friends a tremendous resilience a getting on with it and of course we will find in time i also see uh, many teachers and head teachers who are tired who've worked incredibly hard who've been quite nervous about the whole thing and who who have had in my view scandalously little recognition for that would you agree with that yes I would absolutely agree, Gary. And I think you're, you're right. Students are very flexible. They're very adaptive, much more so than adults in general. And uh, when we look at the educators who work harder, whose days are much longer, and they're doing something that they're, they're performing their profession. So they have very high, in a way, very, very high stakes because a, a lot is, is expected of them in terms of the delivery. And they have to learn to do this in a way that is going to be recognized, recognized by the institution they work for, by the parents of the children that they teach, and by the teachers, by the, the, the students themselves. So, and on top of it, you, as an adult, you have unfortunately a mind that thinks about a lot of other things and a lot of other things that worry you. So, so where, where children might be more, um, in, in a way, able to, to find happiness and joy in the new situation. As adults, we t tend to internalize challenges more than, than our children do. Yeah. So I think that that does add to the level of stress for, um, for a lot of uh, educators. Thanks, Janneke. I've got one, one quick question, but I think it's an important one that, that I want to selfishly ask as well. And I know Colin, Colin is thinking along those lines. So, you know, we all agree on the importance of experience-based learning and of extracurricular activities and of out-of-school learning. What, I'll use Catania as an example, but I could use the Louvre or, or the Opera in Dubai or others. What, what do we need to do to instill into you as a principal the confidence that you can come back to us as part of your school's learning? I think what, uh, what will be top of mind for educators will be once we can go back to a, uh, a different kind of normal, and I, I, do, I, I do hope it will be a different and not the old kind of normal, but it's still going to be um, a focus on safety and uh, health health and safety in, in, the, in the short term. Uh, hopefully when, if we get out of the crisis mode and we feel that there's an overall um, stability worldwide in terms of the, the, the virus and if we see that it will disappear uh, or um, potentially not disappear, but at least the, the, the crisis level will drop significantly, uh, we, might not, we might go back to not being so worried about the social interaction in places that we cannot control. But uh, for educational leaders, of course, we can control our school building, but we cannot control uh, what, what happens on a field trip. And uh, for a school like ours, uh, where field trips are incredibly important, every, every single child does a lot of field trips locally every year because we contextualize the learning. We really depend on in enriching the learning experience through the opportunity to go into Kinzania or to go into Louvre or to, to Oli Oli or to any other, to the opera, as you said, I mean, because these are, these are wonderful opportunities for learning outside of the school building that we have accessible here in Dubai and, um, or in the UAE. Uh, and of course, we will be worried in the first instance in, in terms of the, uh, the safety mechanisms and keeping our students uh, protected. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Faisal, uh, I, I know that as chairman of the Humani Society for Educational Technology, you will have been, and you indicated that you've been busier than ever probably in the last four months. Um, I, I'm intrigued to listen to you about what has changed in terms of technology, schools, the classroom, the connection with home? Um, can, you, can you talk to us about 
about what's happening around that in your mind? I mean, uh, regarding, uh, uh, I mean, um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, during this period, uh, we, you know, uh, we connected a lot, me and you, and, uh, and you knew that, I mean, I mean, I was telling you about, for us, it's been a really like a, you know, it's a roller coaster ride for us. Um, well, before the pandemic, uh, we've been uh, for years talking about the importance of technology integration in education. And, and uh, I mean, it was, it was very difficult uh, discussion to have with, you know, education leaders in Oman, uh, even in, in region. And suddenly this happens and due to the school closure uh, and, and lockdown, now everybody realized that um, for schools to maintain uh, they need uh, technology intervention. So, and, and suddenly, um, you know, it was revealed that the there's, you know, there's no leadership in the market, you know, uh, that anybody could rely on. Um, and, and, and because we are society, you know, our society cited is education technology, then everybody was looking at us. And, and, uh, and, and as a non nonprofit and, and like as an NGO, to take that magnitude of project was really crazy for us. But, but, but understanding that, you know, 100% uh, of our, you know, members are teachers. So, uh, so it, it, it was, you know, it was, there was no option for us because our members were crying, so, you know, for, for help. So we had to move. So um, for us, um, we've been working like crazy with almost all education, uh, education organization from, you know, from, uh, you know, schools, uh, colleges, uh, uh, you know, universities, uh, private, public, uh, up till even small centers, like, you know, special education centers, um, individuals, like, you know, parents, uh, teachers, uh, students themselves. So we've been working uh, continuously with all uh, different, you uh, know, in, uh, in, in a sector and in different ways. And even, even, uh, you know, we start working beyond Oman. Uh, we, in a, we were in a, in a situation we felt that, that, that because everybody is, is facing the same problem. Everybody is, you know, uh, everybody is not lucky like Dwight, you know, school. Um, they did not invest it very well. They, did not, they were not prepared for shift to digital education. Um, and, and, uh, and everybody was reaching out to us. Uh, and we could not say no, uh, you know, as I said that, uh, you know, coming from uh, an organization that the majority or almost everybody is a teacher, they have, you know, these teachers have the habit to, you know, uh, you know to help out. So uh, we've been helping in organization, Oman, Kuwait, uh, UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, up to even UK, uh, you know, through Dr. Gere as well. So, um, so, and, and what we realized that, because, I mean, the, the virus actually, you know, taught us that, you know, that, that we are all connected in a way. So a problem in one country, you know, and, and, and could reach everybody. And, and in that sense also, as a, as, a, as a teachers, we also need to reconnect or connect uh, and become like one global uh, school or education community. If you see from the cases in case studies and also a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people talking, the teacher, I mean, teachers were, you know, I mean, like there's a lot of societies or a lot of countries who are reaching out or teachers from one country reaching out to other teachers in another country, sharing resources, knowledge, skills, uh, whatever they have. There was, there was no boundaries, uh, actually. Um, like, uh, and there's no more discussion about my education system is different, UK education system is different. Suddenly everybody is, is, is working together, um, you know. So, and our goal was, I mean, from, from start, um, and as, as uh, you know, my colleague mentioned, that, I mean, we, we were actually in Dubai when this discussion happened of switching to online education. And, and when we came back, Oman, and we told them, you know, listen, uh, especially GCC countries, they are so much connected. So we know if there is a lockdown in Dubai, then it's going to happen here in Oman. 
if they are moving to online education and that's the only solution they have so far, we need to do that as well in Oman. But we did not get that good response. Um, and, and we did not stay at that point. So even before, like three weeks before the lockdown, we initiated a uh, you know, national wide project to train teachers uh, on online education. Um, you know, using whatever technology so far they have or they know. And we were lucky, like we got, you know, uh, some really great help, help like from companies like Microsoft who stepped in and helped us in that matter. And we may manage to train uh, teachers. And when the, uh, you know, the lockdown happened, um, these teachers, try, you know, th those that we trained, they became trainer and, and it, it grow. And in, so the, the main, main point, like the main aim for us was not actually to have a perfect online education. What actually the main aim was to keep that connection between student and teacher, because that was very crucial for us, that teachers keep communicating with the students. If you do that, then just leave it on, on teachers at least, and then provide just support, just provide all your support to teachers. They will be able to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, drive the, the whole project. Um, but instead, we've seen that in, in you know, organization or ministries here, go back to the same mistake of relying on technology, purchasing technology, while they should take care of teachers. And now, um, after the semester has ended, now uh, we have similar cases like you, you mentioned. Teachers, students, parents, all suffering, all really like tired. Um, we, and, and, and we as a society also been working uh, to, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, we never thought about in one, in, a, in, in one time that we're going to, we would be concerned about student, teacher, parents' well-being. And suddenly, because of that, that's also the role that we took. And, 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 and we were not lucky, actually, like, like uh, you know, maybe other organization, uh, not, not us, but the, the, the education community here in Oman. It's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Faisal, that, that, um, that governments react slowly yes. and, and in a very black and white kind of way, right? Because, because let's face it, I mean, from, from what Yannick is saying, and I know that we'll come to Colin in, in a second, and what you're saying is, you know, this was forced upon us. We wouldn't have chosen to do it like that. It, it's also given us a kick up the backside in a sense, and, and we now need to react. But we will not, it will not be either online or offline. There will be a very good, hopefully, hybrid medium that will serve the children's learning. And, and that, in the end, is, is where it sits. Uh, Colin, um, professor, university teacher, um, and, and this kind of links to what, what, what Faisal was alluding to too, going to university, leaving home and everything else that goes with this is in many ways a form of experience-based learning. Mm -hmm. And now universities are already saying that at least part of 2020, 2021 will be online. Cambridge has announced all of it is online. And what do we see? Students, including my own son, um, will, and particularly international students, will vote with their feet because they don't want to go to university online, it isn't good enough. They want, they want to be there. They want to have that whole experience. They may compromise to a quality hybrid form. So what are you thinking, my friend, around this? Yes, well, um, it's fascinating. The whole debate is fascinating. And you summed it up, I think, by saying it's not going to be either or, or it's going to be a mixture. And we'll learn from both the online and the face-to-face, -face, um, there is a big question for students. What we're doing at Sheffield Hallam University is we're going to make sure that all lectures are recorded. That's interesting because there won't be any face-to-face -face lectures, but you can watch them online and better still, you can play them and play them again and you can stop them and uh, reflect upon things. So what a wonderful experience for students to be able to have all of those lectures available permanently. So the seminars will be running seminars face to face, but all the face to face will be online also and only a limited number of face to face. The rest will be online seminars. So we're, we're taking that mixed bag, but I'd like to uh, throw some different thoughts into the equation about the new normal. Um, 
so I'll just read you the titles of um, one or two books that are behind me at the moment. So listen to this. Learning Design, Conceptualizing a Framework for Learning and Teaching Online. Learning Design, Creating Amazing Learning Experience with Design Thinking. Higher Education by Design. The E-Learning Designer's Handbook. Rethinking Pedagogy for a Digital Age, Principles and Practice of Design. And it goes on and on and on and on. And there's 12 here. And the key word is, have you got it? Design. design. So what's going to happen, uh, I think all of us probably agree this with this, is all of our teachers know their stuff. They know their subject. But this virus has created a situation where we've had to adjust very quickly. We've had to get the capacity to deal with software that sometimes we've never heard of. But it soon passes. I mean, I heard somebody call a, a, a running team the other day, all Zoom and gloom. Well, the students know all about death by PowerPoint, uh, death by quizzes. So what we know from habituation is whatever you do, you can't keep doing the same. So you can't keep doing online. I've been watching Yannick and she's been using her hands. I've seen the videos on her school uh, website where teachers aren't doing this, like we are sat in front of uh, the screen with headshots they're moving about and doing things and showing things on the big screen and geography and and uh, one of the things I've just been writing about over the last few days has been about the centrality of movement um, I said to you girl when we were having a zoom um, just look out the window and as soon as I looked out the window I could see the trees moving in the wind the chickens eating the grass on my lawn the postman walking past down the road and suddenly my world came alive and I've been watching so many people on zoom trying to look interested when <laughs> their meetings obviously look quite boring so we know that um, online has its benefits especially to revisit because there is as I always say to people on my master classes there's an amazing relationship between learning and forgetting it, it's it's an interesting one how we uh, how we achieve that balance and maybe the balance will change right there, there's no doubt about it when i was talking to some youngsters the other day and and i was asking them about whether they like learning online and what they like learning online and then somebody said to me one, one of the kids said to me but but when i go when i want to see baby elephants i'd much rather go to chester zoo than watch them on the telly and and i think and you reflect on that and and if you want to kind of think about that hybrid that's that's kind of where it sits doesn't it that well, we have to stop pretending that it replaces it yeah it's interesting you should say that because um one of the kind of metaphors i use is um it's called the giraffe effect and i had the pleasure of going all the way to uh, nairobi to do some executive management training for the intercontinental hotels and they, they took me out into the into the bush on one of those safari trucks. And I, I saw the giraffe in the distance, a real giraffe in a real natural environment. And I'm a zoologist, so wow. But having taken my daughter to um, a, a zoological place um, uh, in uh, Dudley in the West Midlands, we experienced a, dra a giraffe sticking its head in our car. And I have a photograph of it. And I often say, this is experiential learning. You can touch the beast. And when it moves, you feel the enormity of it. You can smell the urine on its, on its, you know, just on its neck. And when it releases that huge tongue to take the food out of your hand, and you look into its beautiful eyes with those eyelashes that I say any woman would die for, that is an experience of a giraffe, not the teacher in the distance in the binoculars. And, and what I'm seeing online now is my son, like your son, is taking amazing control of his, of his learning. He's, he's working exactly to a school day, but he showed me some maths. Uh, and, and I wasn't very good at maths at school. I'm good at looking after my own money, but I wasn't very good at maths. And I saw these maths videos and I thought if I'd have had those at school, to watch them again, to watch them again, and to see on an interactive screen how the tutor was highlighting things and showing me things. It was remarkable. And I think what we're seeing is the question here, one of the questions is, so who are the teachers? What we're seeing is parents need to play a role. We're learning a lot about that. And parents are struggling as well. Um, the teachers, uh, the children's responsibility. But when you see things like these maths uh, tutorials, 
And I've been fascinated that wherever I go in the world, and I'm sure all of us today will have experienced this, wherever you go, have we all not seen the uh, little shops that sell extra mass tuition, extra mass tuition, extra mass tuition, wherever I go, Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, anywhere, you can buy extra mass tuition. So what's wrong with maths? And what I'm seeing is the best of the best of the best maths methods and teachers are coming in online and schools are buying them in and they're using them to supplement the maths teaching the the maths teachers are using them the children can take them home and see them on maths watch and other sites well, we've got them here in the uk i'm sure they're global so i think that this partnership is changing and finally what i would say people are beginning to realize that designing the experiences is really crucial uh, the world famous London underground map is a classic example of a piece of navigation where it's dead easy to go to Buckingham Palace because you go on the blue train, you get off after three little circles and then you go on the green train and you get off. What I'm trying to show people is uh, that is a, is a phenomenal design uh, pattern. And if you watch the museums, they're doing the same thing. They're giving people experience enhancement, handheld things. So you can go into a room and it takes you along the little railway line into the next room and then you can listen to somebody tell you about something you can look at the picture in the uh, art museum in Amsterdam and it's all about designing the flow the shape the travel the navigation and you can touch though you can create these for, for children and adults you can touch those little stations and they can hear a little video about the lesson that they're going to have next week and the week after because we're finding that students come into lectures and because they just come out of a lecture, they don't know where they are. They're not navigating their experience and they're not seeing it unfold in front of them. So everybody's starting to take a closer look at experience design. What a fabulous thing that's going to happen. I, I'm, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think, you know, the, the question, who is the teacher, will also come down to institutions. So, so I think, for example, from, from our point of view, Kizania will need to much better get its act together and, and become an online resource as well as as well as a real resource. The Louvre in Paris in sin, in the last twelve or so weeks has had ten point four million unique visitors onto its children's website. Clearly, they're doing they're doing many things right. And I think I think to reach that bit whereby current teachers are facilitators or, or maybe even lollipop people directing children in the right directions to, to achieve that route map i think uh, i think is is the route to go i'm kind of conscious of time and i'm really happy that it's flown i'm, I'm going to uh, ask each one of you because it's the end of this series just the very simple question with, with if i may with a one-line answer if i look at september 2022 rather than 2021 um are we, Colin, are we optimistic or are we pessimistic? Optimistic. I think um, there's always bad and good uh, aside to everything. I think the virus has given us a little bit of a shake up. I think a lot of us are having to learn technology, learn new uh, ideas. But I think this focus on design uh, is going to be quite fundamental. The fact that I could just list 12 books with the word design in the title is a, is a signal it's a signal that something is changing. We, we know our stuff, we know the subject, but what we need to do is, is work through the whole design of the whole experience in a collaborative way with a big drawing board. And it's about choreo choreography. It's about the art and science of designing fabulous experiences for learning. Brilliant, thank you. Faisal, optimistic, pessimistic? Optimistic. Um, I mean, um, if we see like, uh, if we say that the modern education system is a result of the World War I and World War II, um, I think this is also an international crisis. So I would say that we need, we need a new education system. Uh, we need change in education system uh, 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 like before. Or even, uh, you know, change the concept of the, you know, the current modern edu education schooling system. Um, I would say that uh, the, the, what Prof, you know, Prof. Colin would say, you know, mention about offline and online. I would hope that that should be balanced. Um, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, putting something online, something offline. I would say that, that it should enable schools to provide more rooms for students' creativity and focus more on student individual qualities. And, and, uh, and that the normal schooling can happen online. And it, it happens, actually. If you see kids when they play video games, 
they're actually learning and 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 there's no time constraint for them and there's no end for the skills that they learn um so that that you know we need to uh trust on student and make schools more like uh you know a very creative environment for for kids uh and also and 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 let the education happens also outside schools not just all in, inside the schools uh, so this is what we discussed before the outdoor learning you know uh, opportunities tremendous opportunities that um you know we have in our society but kids see that as sightseeing rather than a learning opportunities thank you faisal yanika i think i know the answer but optimistic <laughs> or pessimistic <laughs> Definitely, nothing but optimism. Optimism can come from me, Gare. You're absolutely right. I, I am absolutely optimistic. Um, I'm obviously optimistic because I have the privilege of working with an age group uh, that represent our future, and I I want to think positively about our future. So having the privilege of working with the pre-K to uh, to twelve, meaning three year olds to eighteen year olds, that in itself is kind of a vision for a positive future. And you see how resilient they are, as we have talked about. So. I think from, from that perspective, definitely optimistic. But what makes me even more optimistic is that, and, and I think what, you've, what Faisal said in terms of how moral education came out of two world wars, what has ha what hopefully, and this is my, 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 my optimism for education, is that finally, this is going to be the crisis. Unfortunately, it had to be a crisis, but if the crisis can lead to a significant change, and I totally agree with Professor Colin, a design change in education, then I'm even more optimistic because what has happened, I think for the first time, uh, maybe for the first time ever, industries are more connected and uh, we're listening to we're listening as adults much more to what we need to change so and i i do hope that we're going to change something fundamental so that we are no longer going to see in 10 years that we're still a industry that that was created in the industrial revolution let's hope that we will be come an industry that's that kind of blossomed out of a pandemic but that will will be a new kind of uh, of normal entirely where we're focusing far more on on developing skills and entrepreneurial mindsets so that these young brilliant individuals can go out and create something far more sustainable than what we have been able to to do over the the last many 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 decades so in that regard, I'm very optimistic and I do see opportunities for learning to happen absolutely everywhere and all the time. And there will be far more teachers than, than just the educators in the school, but they will still be, be incredibly important because they have, they have a particular understanding of how you can teach others to learn. And we really need to develop interest in learning continuously so that the uh, the future gener generations will see themselves on the learning journey so that we can redesign the way we think con continuously and uh, that learning definitely doesn't stop when you graduate with a diploma thank you so much i knew it optimistic uh, thank you thank you yannicka arnes faisal ali balushi and colin beard for shining lights today and and i hope to see you all one way or the other very soon I, I think i think there is light at the end of this of this tunnel a big thank you to the audience wherever you are for being with us and that's it thanks to all my guests in this first series thank you all for shining so many lights and thank you to pearson and to the incomparable katie meehan in particular thank you also to lucy crabby of kestrel for guidance and support please join us again for series two starting on the 22nd of september also with tuesday Topics will include, include the role of business and NGOs in the future of education. How well do we know our children? The environment is the third teacher and much, much more. Guests include senior representatives from the world of business, education, charity and politics, as well as a one-off interview with a legendary Professor Carla Rinaldi, president, and, uh, president of the Fondazione Regio Children, co-founder of the Regio Media Approach, and in my humble opinion, one of the most important educational philosophers of a generation. She's also 
a very, very dear personal friend of mine and one of the nicest and kindest people you could possibly meet. So be there or be really, really, really square. Until then, from all of us, please stay safe, stay well, and stay happy. I am going to walk the dogs, as I've always done after a chat. Florence and Constance, or Flo and Co, as I call them. Goodbye for now, and see you very, very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.